What's up guys, UFC 298 just wrapped up and what a card that was man, amazing card, a lot of great fights, a lot of great finishes, a legend falls but it's a change of the guard which is very healthy for the sport even though it's bittersweet for any Volkanovski fan, you don't want to see him get knocked out like that you know and it happened twice to him in a row, you know two knockouts within what four or five months is not good and he needs to take a very long time off I think I'm guessing maybe a year and Tapori is probably going to fight someone else in the meantime Whitaker versus Costa was a great fight Neil and Gary wasn't I enjoyed Marav versus Cejudo Hernandez and Kapilov was a good fight Lemos and Dern was fun Delima and Tafa was fun you know Nakamura and Vera not exciting Ming Young and Ribeiro was exciting Barlow's finish on Quinlan was crazy my total score for this card I would give it like an 8 out of 10 I think this was very good and the main event sealed the deal Tapuria now 15 and 0 as the featherweight champion one of the most prestigious titles in the UFC knocking out arguably number one or number two greatest featherweight of all time and he does it in the second round this went almost exactly like my pre-fight breakdown but my pick for the winner was ultimately incorrect Volkanovski could not pocket box with Tapura at all but once Tapura got right in front of him and Volk was not able to clinch up the power punches came way too quickly and Volkanovski was out before he even knew it at range though Volk was winning this fight he looked amazing until the knockout there's gonna be a lot of debate as to whether the Islam fight has something to do with Volkanovski getting knocked out we have no idea but I will say I don't think Volk could ever take that punch I don't think any version of Volk could take a punch like that especially from a guy who's known to knock opponents out with one shot I mean he folded a lightweight with one punch it was such a devastating shot and even if Volk, let's say this let's say if Volkanovski would take that right overhand because the poor did step to the right as he was throwing it which takes power off of it let's say Volk was able to take the punch that follow-up left hook he threw after would have hit Volkanovski and that shot would have put him out cold no matter what that left hook has so much leverage in it there is no way Volk would be able to take that Volk has never had an iron chin never did right and some fighters got it and some fighters don't Volk has always had some of an average chin he's not a guy who wants to sit in front of you and take shots right he did that one time against Chad Mendez he got dropped for it but he was able to pull through you don't do that against a young in his prime Ilya Taburia and he didn't right he tried to stay away he was trying to throw the kicks he was trying to keep Taburia at the end of the jab even clinched up with him when he did get in close before the knockout and that was his way to neutralize the aggression but Taburia adapted to it and knocked him out Taburia is better every time we see him he is evolving constantly and a guy as young as he is he's like 27 years old I just said he's in his prime he's probably not even in his prime which is the scariest part about Ilya Taporia. Usually featherweights hit their prime like 29 years old. He's maybe one or two years before his prime and he's already the featherweight champion. And it just goes to show you, man, every legend has a very hard time with these new generation fighters. Every single one of them. And only a few have ever come out of those fights victorious. This is an example as to how difficult it is to beat that next generation. And the 35-year-old thing, you know, where every champion has lost from 170 and down, when they're 35 years old or older, is still a thing. I feel bad for Vol Volkanovski is a lot of people's favorites for a very good reason. The guy's awesome as a human being. He's awesome as a fighter. An absolute legend. Going to be a Hall of Famer. He's done so much in his career. He's not done yet, but he needs a long, long time off. His coaches need to sit him down for a second. But we can appreciate the mentality that he has that he always wants to get back in there. Now, it leaves into the question, is Volkanovski the greatest featherweight of all time? I could see it both ways. I could see it between him and Jose Aldo. Jose Aldo has the numbers. He's also defeated very, very good fighters. I could see it both ways, but I'm... I'm guessing I haven't seen everybody's opinion on it but I'm guessing people are going to say it is Jose Aldo because this fight with Tapori was supposed to be the cementing of Volkanovski as the greatest featherweight of all time. It's tough to pick one or the other because Jose has all of the numbers but Volk defeated stronger competition. For Ilya Tapori man he's going to be around for a very long time. Whether he holds the belt for a while I don't know. Every featherweight champion besides Connor which I think he could have done if he stayed around. If Connor stayed at featherweight and he was able to make the weight cut I think he would have dominated this weight class for a very long time. In fact the guy that probably would have beaten him may have been Volkanovski which is crazy to think about. I don't even know if Holloway would have ever became champ if Connor never went up to lightweight but who knows that's just uh speculation every single featherweight champion besides Connor because he moved up have been somewhat dominant or at least held the belt for a considerable amount of time so maybe Tapuria follows suit because it doesn't look like he's gonna go up to lightweight unless some way they grant him that Connor McGregor fight wait did they announce UFC 300 it's Pereira versus Hill that's a great fight I just wonder why it wasn't Connor versus Chandler but with Volka Tapuria there needs to be an immediate rematch for Volkanovski so I hope that's going to be his next fight and hopefully Volk does not come back this year I say that for his health and as for Tapuria I think he's going to want to defend his belt before Volk comes back so Tapuria versus Max Holloway 
should be the next fight. And will he be the guy to defeat the legends of today? Not just Volk, but can he get past Max as well? Max is going to be a difficult challenge for him because Max does not go away, man. That guy's got an iron chin. But can Tapuri take him down and submit him? That's an interesting part of it. And then we go to the co-main event. Robert Whitaker defeating Paulo Costa by a decision. 229-28 and 130-27. One judge actually gave him the first round. I mean, he was winning that round until he got caught by a wheel kick. It didn't really land with the heel. It landed with like the side of the foot. But Whitaker working off the jab and the calf kick. Landing those all fight. And Paulo Costa was very impressive. What about him? That was one of the most technical versions of Paulo Costa we've ever seen. Didn't look like he had ring rust. Working off a jab. Has some decent left hooks here and there, but most of them did get dodged. The head kicks were getting really close outside of that wheel kick. And I really like the angles that Whitaker was working with off of his jab. Pump fake the jab for a stutter step. Get Paulo Costa to lean back a little bit. Then he would blitz in behind with that jab, fading out with the left hook moving away from Paulo Costa. And he just didn't see this happen at all. Even though Costa looked good, Whitaker was operating at another level. And it throws out all the doubts about Whitaker after losing to Drickus Duplessis. It just shows you how good Drickus is. Whitaker is still performing as usual. He's beating every other contender outside now of Drickus and Adesanya, furthering his legacy as one of the greatest middleweights of all time. But not too many head kicks this fight, and it's because Paulo Costa was shoulder rolling a lot. He was always ready to throw the left hook, which is going to cause a natural shoulder roll because of how high he keeps his shoulder up. So it's going to be harder for the kick to catch him there. Whitaker would need the kick to go over the shoulder and hit the top of the head, which is a lot harder to do, especially with Paulo Costa always looking to counter him. But the jab was there all fight, the one-two was there, the calf kicks, which you don't see a lot from Robert Whitaker, so he is evolving as well. But now here's an issue. What do you do with him? You could do a Sean Strickland fight. You could do a Hamza fight because we know that they want to give him some higher ranked guy. Maybe a third fight with Adesanya. Anything else I don't see making any sense. So it has to be either Strickland, Adesanya, or Hamzat. I think they have plans for Adesanya, so I don't expect it to be against Whitaker. Maybe Hamzat's on the book somewhere. Maybe Strickland has a rematch with Drickus. We have no idea. If Strickland's not getting a rematch with Drickus, let's do Whitaker versus Strickland. If Strickland is getting a rematch with Drickus, then let's do Whitaker versus Hamzat. And as for Paulo Costa, he is number six. He just lost to Whitaker. He already lost to Marvin Vittori. He already lost to Adesanya. He never fought Jared Kenanier, though. You could do a Kenanier fight. You can do a Brendan Allen fight, or a Hamza fight. Those are the three that I think make sense. The one I would love to see the most is Jared Kananir because of how exciting that fight would be. And then we go to Ian Gary defeating Jeff Neal by a decision. The first two rounds are pretty close, but I did have also Ian Gary win in the fight. I gave him the first and third. I gave Jeff Neal the second, but these can go either way. 30-27. I can understand it because of how close those first two rounds were. There is a way that you can give Ian Gary those very slightly, but it doesn't mean that the fight was dominant. A lot of people see 30-27 and think someone won dominantly, but that's not what it means at all. It means that maybe some of the rounds were just slightly edged towards a fighter, still making it a close fight. But I had it 29-28 Ian Gary, not 30-27. I was just so confused with what Jeff Neal was doing. He was talking about how he's so motivated for the fight. He's talking about he's in shape again. He's back in his prime form and all this stuff. He was dealing with the sepsis and recovering. It took him a long time to do so even while he came back to fight. And he said this is like the best form he's ever been in. And he comes out there running around the octagon with Ian Gary and clinching up with him. And not even exploding with combos off the break from the clinches. He just clinched up and then Ian Gary would escape and circle around again. Yeah, Ian Gary was also running around, but that's what he's going to do to win, right? He won because he was able to do that. Jeff Neal lost because he wasn't cutting him off that well. He caught him toward the end of the first round, at the beginning of the second, and for the rest of the fight, man, it just was not looking good. They have to have circled around that octagon like 50 times. And Ian Gary's fighting with range, right? He's the longer guy, and Jeff Neal needs to get on the inside. And the way to do that against a longer guy is to cut him off. And Ian Gary was constantly landing a shot, landing a body kick, and then moving around, landing an in and out jab, then running around again, body kick again, moving around again. And this just kept happening, and this is racking up points for Ian Gary. It was not fun to watch. A very uneventful fight and this seems to be the kind of guy that Ian Gary is going to be at least against uh, dangerous strikers as he's mentioned he's making it seem like he won't do this against Colby Covington or some of these other guys but if he's finding a Shafkar Rachmanov a Jeff Neal a Kamar Usman some of these guys that hit really hard he's probably gonna fight this way against them you know point fight and move land a jab land a low kick land a body kick and just run around and these fighters have to be able to cut him off. That's the biggest thing. I think Jeff Neal could have won, though. I really think he could have. If he cut him off more, I was so confused by it. And he was dapping him up the whole time. And his, his coach was telling him, stop dapping him up. Fight him. Get at him. And even after his coach told him that, he's still doing it. Every round, he's doing it. Over and over. You know, they miss a strike. Oh, dap up. I hit you. Oh, dap. At the end of the day, Ian Gary fought a smart fight. Not an exciting fight, but a smart one. And he got the win. 
Who should these two fight next? Ian Gary just defeated the number eight ranked fighter. I can see him getting Colby Covington, actually. Maybe they could do that fight. Colby's number five. And as for Jeff Neal, maybe fight Kevin Holland again, get the rematch in there, or fight the loser of Jack Della Maddalena versus Gilbert Burns. Marab Davalashvili defeats Henry Cejudo by a decision. Scientist has got to study this guy. I just don't understand that cardio. He is... I think the best 135er in the world right now. As I saw someone at X post, it makes 299 look pointless because this is the best guy. It doesn't. But that's the feeling that it gets. Marab looks like Tony Ferguson or Habib when they were coming up before they ever became champion. Everybody knew all oh, these two are the best lightweights in the world and they're not even the champion yet. Marab is that guy and he has the best personality. His fighting style is exhausting to watch. Maybe not the most exciting for a lot of fans, but at least he's very active. At least he's doing a lot, right? He's attempting a lot of takedowns, throwing a lot of punches. He's just not the most powerful guy in the world and he doesn't have the best submissions either. I appreciate the pace he's able to put on opponents. It's absolutely insane. It reminds me of like Colby Covington, but more, which I never thought would be possible. He out-wrestled Henry Cejudo. He outpaced him. He outstruck him in the second and third rounds. That moment in the fight where he picked Cejudo up and everybody knew, oh, this time he got him because Cejudo's reversing some of those takedowns and defending a bunch of them, right? Cejudo's looking really good in that first round. Even rocked Marab with that follow-up left hook inside the pocket, which it does show Marab has a big weakness there. Not just that time, but multiple times in the fight, when Cejudo engaged him in the pocket, Marab always lowers that right hand when he's throwing his left. So I do expect that left hook opening to always be there. Marab is arguably the best 135er, but he's not without weaknesses. Fighters can still beat him. O'Malley can still catch him with a shot like that. Corey Sandhagen potentially could do it. Chito Vera has a very good and sneaky left hook. He could potentially find a shot like that. No one's unbeatable, but Marab is closest to being unbeatable. And when he picked up Henry Cejudo, it was like, okay, now he's got Cejudo. Oh, and now Cejudo's not escaping this takedown. And he brought him in front of Mark Zuckerberg. I don't know what he had with Mark Zuckerberg, but he was talking to him through the whole fight and he wanted to fight in front of him just so he could talk to him more. And Cejudo did get away with a lot of fence grabs. The ref did not step in on any of those fence grabs and the last one he gave him a warning for it. It was like three or four times he was grabbing the fence when Marab was trying to take him down. It was crazy. I, I, I was shocked that he was allowed to do it and some of them were very obvious. Like his hand was reached out all the way, extending, grabbing the fence and the ref just says nothing about it. Even the commentators were saying, yo, this guy's grabbing the fence. How does the ref not see it? And still, Marab beat Henry Cejudo. He was able to do something to Cejudo that Aljamain Sterling could not do. And if there was a fourth and fifth rounds, those would have been dominant winning rounds for Marab Davalashvili. What a performance by Marab, man. I used to not be a big fan of his, right? Especially with the way he beat Jose Aldo, but he has been growing on me. You know, especially with his personality, I'm appreciating the pace he puts on opponents. What's next for Marab? That was a question that was asked before this fight. It's obviously a title shot. He gets the winner of Sean O'Malley versus Chito Vera, and I think he beats both of them. Again, he's not unbeatable. He can get caught. He does leave openings, but more chances, I think he beats both of them and probably ragdolls both of them, to be honest. And as for Henry Cejudo, he said if he lost his fight to Marab, he's going to retire. So it's sad. You know, Cejudo is a legend. He's a future Hall of Famer. He's done amazing things. That four win streak that he had where he beat Demetrius Johnson, TJ Dillashaw, Mala Morais, and Dominic Cruz still to this day goes down as one of the greatest stretch of wins in UFC history. I hope the best for Henry Cejudo. I hope whatever he does after this. Thank you, Henry Cejudo, for an amazing career at that time the youngest freestyle wrestling gold medalist in the olympics a double weight ufc champion and defended both belts while defeating some of the greatest fighters in the sport anthony hernandez gets the submission win over roman kapilov second round rear naked choke it took him a while to get him down man he shot many many times and kapilov had amazing takedown defense he just did not have the brazilian jiu-jitsu awareness once he got down so to get him down is difficult but if you do, he's much easier to handle. Hernandez was very tough. He showed his durability, kept walking Kapilov down, forced him on the back foot the whole time. Kapilov still was throwing kicks even on the back foot, which was impressive. That one back hop roundhouse to the body was beautiful. Not too far before he got taken down. And landed some good left hands to the body, some good jabs. He's shown to be the better striker of the fight, but the technique on the feet is not everything. Hernandez was able to walk through most of this. He got right in Kapilov's face, dirty boxing with him, shot the double leg. Finally, Kapilov did not switch his legs for a defensive single leg. Hernandez was able to dump him to the ground, and that rear naked choke, man, he was so confident once he had it. Hernandez is going to be a problem for the middleweight division. It's yet another grappler that can prove a lot of issues for the other contenders that don't really know this side of the game. 
There's not a lot of older veteran grapplers and wrestlers in this division. Most of them are these younger guys coming up or have already reached the top like Dracus Duplessis. So very soon, we might see the middleweight division turn from striking to grappling very quickly. And off of this win, I think a fight with Jack Hermanson or Roman Delizze would be really good for Hernandez. Then Amanda Lemos defeats Mackenzie Dern by a decision. It looked like the fight came down to the first round. The second definitely went to Amanda Lemos very easily. Mackenzie Dern, I thought, probably won the third round. The first round was won by Lemos, which I do agree with because she did land the more damaging shots, especially those calf kicks. Gotta love physics though, man. The physics were definitely physicking that fight. And I was very confused with the commentating during this fight. Like... Michael Bisney said fair play to Mackenzie throwing windmill punches and Dean Thomas saying that her body language got to Amanda Lemos. She got hit in the eye and fell down, not because she got rocked, but because of the pain. That's not anything to take away from Dern. It's just the commentating was so weird. Dern came out there like she got a dog in her. You know, she was relentless for most of that fight. She kept going forward. She kept throwing punches. But the lack of technique in her boxing and the lack of technique in her wrestling has been so apparent throughout her career. Lemos caught her very easily with that right hand. And I can only imagine if Mackenzie Dern fought someone like Zhang Wei Li or something, you know? Those counter punches would come a lot easier. And the thing about Lemos is she just never really had the best fight IQ. She was always a pretty weak grappler. And that's a big reason as to why I even picked Dern to win this fight. Dern had a weakness to the striking. I did not expect Lemos to throw that many calf kicks and they were causing a lot of damage. And you could just see the difference between like the women's straw weights versus the men heavyweights. The drastic amount of power in their leg kicks. Mackenzie Dern has a lot of potential. It's just I think the training is getting focused in the wrong places. It looks like she may be spending a lot of her time learning how to strike and it hasn't been going too great i think a lot of her training should be focused on her wrestling her best asset is her brazilian jiu-jitsu which was clearly shown in this lemos fight lemos was never really that great of a grappler it's always been her weakest point mackenzie duran showed complete superiority in that department but i wish she developed a way to take the fight to the ground and not rely on her opponents to have bad enough fight iq to take her down because lemos did that when she hurt mackenzie duran she should have walked away. When she tied up in the clinch, she should have even tried to take her to the ground or even tie up with her, stay in the clinch at all. This is also a problem with Marcos Rogero de Lima in the next fight where he hurt Justin Toff with the light kicks and shot a takedown on him. It's very strange to watch. Can you imagine if Lemos never even entertained the clinch or the grappling whatsoever? I don't even think Mackenzie Dern would have had a chance in this fight. But fighters like Mackenzie Dern and Brian Ortega and Paul Craig and you know various other fighters with a similar kind of skill set, for some very strange reason, they have a lack of wrestling when that should be the number one thing they work on after their Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu career. And it becomes so easily for them to fall in love with their striking. If Mackenzie Dern had like Tatiana Suarez level wrestling or at least somewhat competent wrestling, she could legitimately be a title contender, if not even a champion. But because she lacks that entire skill, she's probably never going to get there. And it's a shame knowing that a fighter has that kind of potential. I think Amanda Lemos should be fighting Tatiana Suarez next. And Mackenzie Dern should fight Lupi Godinez. Marcos Rogério de Lima destroying Junior Tafa's legs with those calf kicks, man. And I don't know if he added it for the fight, if he knew something about Junior Tafa's career, because he did fight in kickboxing for a bit. Or he was going to do the same thing against Justin Tafa. But Justin Tafa was a solid paw. Junior Tafa is orthodox, so it's a bit of a different angle for the leg kicks. I think he might have added it against Junior instead. And they work to perfection. It's very interesting how, you know, a guy who was ranked and the heavyweight glory kickboxing scene didn't know at all how to defend these kicks. And he's been in MMA for a few years. You know, he's he has six professional fights and still does not know how to defend a calf kick. In fact, most heavyweights don't know how to defend a calf kick. For example, Cyril Ghan is throwing calf kicks or Tom Aspinall is throwing calf kicks. Rarely do their opponents know how to defend one. And the damage quickly got settled in. I thought Junior Tafa was going to come out there aggressive because he only had one day to prepare for it. He only had one single day to get ready for a top 15 opponent only in a seventh professional MMA fight and heavyweight has the biggest puncher's chance and I thought that was the way that Junior Tafa would try to secure a finish but he was trying to be technical he was staying at range getting kicked to the leg after like one or two of those I was surprised he didn't engage more because staying at range like that, he's going to keep getting kicked to the leg. And he never did anything to address it. And not only that, he couldn't really deal well with the wrestling. Once he got taken to the ground, his ability to get up was not great. He didn't have a lot of great reversals or anything like that off of his back. 
How can you expect a kickboxer with only six professional fights to deal with someone heavier than him on top and having way more experience, not only in this game, but just in grappling in general? It was a very tough fight for Junior Tafa. A lot of credit and respect given to him to even take this fight on one day notice. And what's a bit of leg damage for a paycheck? Would you guys do the same thing? Would you guys take a fight with Marcos Rogero de Lima on one day notice, knowing that he's going to batter your legs and that's probably how he's going to finish you? Would you do it? At the very least, Junior Tafa didn't take much head damage in the fight, so... There is that. I think you should put the, the fight with the brother again. I think Justin Tafa versus Marco Rogero de Lima should be the fight that gets put together again. It was a very interesting fight going into it. I was expecting a banger with them two. And I know a lot of people probably say, oh, look what happened to Junior Tafa. Imagine what happens to Justin Tafa. But Justin Tafa is different than Junior. He's a better counter puncher. He's much heavier. He has a little bit more experience in this game. He's been in the UFC since like 2019. And has been on a roll with knockouts. So it was a different kind of fight. It would be a harder guy to take to the ground. A guy who has to cut down to the heavyweight division. Whereas Junior Tafa might be 20 to 30 pounds lighter than him. You know, so I would like to see the rematch get put together. Rinyar Nakamura gained the decision went against Carlos Vera. It was mostly just wrestling. Not exciting to watch. But it was good experience for Rinyar Nakamura to go through three rounds wrestling against a guy who constantly was attacking his leg. Right, He kept going to his leg for submissions. Carlos Vera was very willing to just go to his back and it caused Nakamura to constantly have to wrestle with him and Nakamura also apparently I don't know if there's any evidence of it but he said that he might have broke his hand in the first round we do hear that excuse a lot when fighters put on boring fights a lot of times they do say that they were injured and that's why it happened but it might be true Rene Nakamura may have broken his hand in the first round he wasn't throwing a lot of punches when he got on top of Carlos Vera even before Vera was rolling for the leg there were a lot of opportunities for Nakamura to land punches on him and he didn't do as much as he could have but it also leads me to believe man knees on the ground should be allowed and it stops this whole rolling for the leg kind of fights that we all just don't like to watch man I like seeing wrestling more than I like seeing that right that is probably the most boring fighting style in the entire UFC in terms of entertainment level but but anyone who's a fan of wrestling this performance was probably pretty exciting for you to watch and now he's 9-0 Zhang Ming Young knocking Bretson Ribeiro out cold man Ribeiro made a big big mistake man he had the reach he was managing distance very well landing the 1-2 and Zhang didn't really have a good defense to it he wasn't blocking it he wasn't slipping it he wasn't parrying it he was getting hit at the end of the punch the whole time and it looked like he didn't have have a good feeling of Ribeiro's range until that last exchange he met Ribeiro head-on right this is after he got hit in the eye and he wanted a break he actually wanted a break for getting hit in the eye can you imagine if he got that time out this knockout probably would not have happened he's probably thanking ref Beltron that he did not step in one exchange they both jabbed inward right straight left hook put Ribeiro out man it's exactly what I was saying in my prediction video Ribeiro just does not have a good chin I've seen him getting rocked too many times and Zhang used to be a heavyweight he's used to getting hit by much bigger men like I said before he carries that power from heavyweight to light heavyweight and you saw it unfold right there Danny Barlow defeats Josh Quinlan by a third round TKO in the first two rounds he was having a hard time of fighting the left hand as Josh Quinlan was so defensive he was in a shell for so much of that fight until he got aggressive because he was losing being defensive in this game is not a way to win unless you got pinpoint accuracy to hurt your opponent with everything you throw which Quinlan does not have Quinlan was losing because Danny Barlow was landing the bigger shots he was causing a little bit more damage enough to win those rounds and then he came out in the third Quinlan came out super aggressive trying to get this finish which you cannot blame him for doing and he exposed himself to the left hand of Barlow they call him the left hand to God because that's how he beats most of his opponents. That left hand, man, super precise when he gets that opening. Great finish by Danny Barlow. Oban Elliott defeating Val Woodburn. I do have to catch up on that fight and also the Miranda Maverick fight. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. And if you did, make sure you give this a like. Make sure to subscribe, hit the bell for notifications. And I'll see you guys in the next video.